Hi everyone, this lesson is on the condition known as listeriosis, which is a condition that is caused by infection with listeria monocytogenes. So we're going to talk about how this bacteria actually causes infection. We'll talk about pathophysiological mechanisms. We'll also talk about the signs and symptoms, which patient groups are more at risk, and we'll finally talk about how it's diagnosed and how it's treated. So this condition, as we mentioned before, is caused by listeria monocytogenes. Listeria monocytogenes is a gram-positive bacilli bacteria, meaning that it is a rod-shaped bacteria, as shown in this image here. Now, the prevalence of listeria monocytogenes infections and listeriosis has decreased over the past several decades due to improved sanitary methods. There have been several past foodborne outbreaks in the 1980s, but for the most part, the numbers of infections has been declining. However, we still see the occasional smaller outbreak, and we're going to find that infection in particular patient populations is going to be more common and cause more severe illness. We'll talk about why that is as we go through this lesson. So some of these patient populations include immunocompromised patients, so patients with a poor immune system functioning, so patients who have HIV or AIDS, patients who are on immunosuppressive drugs, patients who have diabetes. And another group of patients is the extremes of age, meaning that the ones that are the youngest and the ones that are the oldest, so newborns, neonates, they're more at risk for this condition. And we also see the elderly population being more at risk as well. And again, both of these have to do with a poor immune system functioning in general. And then pregnant individuals are also at more risk. Not so much the pregnant patients themselves, but we will see that they can be affected a bit more by this condition in the third trimester, but more so for the unborn fetus, and this can cause issues. So again, we'll go through that as we go through the signs and symptoms later on. And this condition is actually the third leading cause of death from foodborne illnesses. So some other important facts about listeria monocytogenes includes that there are 13 serotypes with three that are able to infect humans. So these are the three. As we mentioned before, it's a gram-positive bacilli bacteria. So it's a rod-shaped, it's gram-positive, but it is also a facultative intracellular aerobic bacteria. So those terms mean that it is intracellular, meaning that it can get inside of host cells, but it's facultative, meaning that it doesn't have to be inside the host cell. It can be outside or inside. So it can live either inside or outside host cells. And it's aerobic, meaning that it requires oxygen. Some other important factors with regards to this bacteria is that it's able to reproduce at very low temperatures. Now, this is very different than most other bacteria where they can actually slow down reproduction at lower temperatures, but these ones can actually maintain a high reproductive rate even at lower temperatures, including temperatures of refrigeration. So at one to four degrees Celsius, they can still reproduce at significant levels. And another important factor with regards to infection is that oftentimes larger numbers of organisms are required to cause the infection. But because they can still reproduce even when they're refrigerated, oftentimes this is not an issue. So there's going to be so many organisms, say for instance in refrigerated food, that they can still cause infection. And we'll talk about what types of foods are more likely to be contaminated by this bacteria. Now where do these organisms actually come from? Most of the time, infection is going to be via the fecal-oral route, meaning that a patient is infected, and then it's spread through their feces into the environment, and due to contamination, improper hygiene, or unsanitary conditions, other individuals can pick this bacteria up in a particular contaminated food, and then they get infected, and it goes back into their gastrointestinal system, and then the cycle continues. So what are some of the contaminated foods that we can see listeria monocytogenes being in? Some of these include processed meats, so deli meats, hot dogs, especially if they're uncooked, and other raw or undercooked meats. So because we had mentioned before, this bacteria can survive and reproduce in refrigerated or low temperature environments, having meat in the fridge and then trying to cook it but not cooking it enough can be a source of this bacteria. Another important source is going to be unpasteurized dairy products, including milk and soft cheeses. So unpasteurized milk and soft cheeses are going to be important sources of this bacteria. And a shift away from consuming unpasteurized dairy products is one of the reasons why we've seen a decline in the prevalence of this bacterial condition. And we can also see it in unwashed raw vegetables and smoked seafood. Now, consumption of contaminated food products is not the only way humans can be infected by this bacteria. They can also be infected transplacentally, so across the placenta. So the fetus can be infected by this during pregnancy and the newborn or neonate can also be infected by this through 
rupturing of amniotic membranes and during vaginal delivery as well. Now let's talk about the pathophysiology and the virulence factors that Listeria uses to infect individuals. So when a patient first consumes this bacteria in a contaminated food product, the bacteria is going to go into the stomach and the stomach is going to be acidified. Now, one of the virulence factors that this bacteria uses to essentially survive this acidic environment is what is called an adaptive acid tolerance response. So Listeria has this adaptive acid tolerance response or ATR that allows it to survive the acidity in the stomach. Now, at certain pHs, at certain lower pHs, meaning that the stomach is more acidic, some of the bacteria or enough of the bacteria can be destroyed to help either lessen the infection or completely prevent the infection from happening. So this is a reason why patients who are on proton pump inhibitors like pentoprazole or omeprazole are at a higher risk for getting listeria because those proton pump inhibitors are reducing the acidity in the stomach. So even though this bacteria has this adaptive acid tolerance response, they're able to survive acidic environments. Some level of acidity can still cause them problem, can still destroy enough of these organisms. So being on a proton pump inhibitor can worsen the infection. Now, once the listeria enters into the host, it has certain bacterial membrane proteins on its surface. One of them is known as internalin A and the other one is internalin B. So internalin A and internalin B are both proteins that are on its surface to allow it to bind to protein receptors on the host cell. So for instance, internalin A allows the Listeria bacteria to bind to ecoderin, and this is a way for the Listeria to adhere to a host cell. And then internalin B will bind to what is called MET receptor on a host cell. So internalin A binds to ecoderin, internalin B binds to MET. So it binds to those host cell receptors to adhere to the host cell, and then the host cell is going to take it up. It's going to engulf that bacteria in a vacuole. So oftentimes the host cell is going to engulf the bacteria and will engulf other proteins to phagocytize those proteins. However, Listeria has a particular tool in its arsenal called Listeriolysin and also has phosphatidyl inositol, specific phospholipase C, both of which can help it escape from host cell vacuoles or these phagosomes. So it can escape from the vacuole and enter into the host cell. So Listeriolysin can help it burrow a hole through the host cell vacuole membrane. And this phospholipase C can help it break down phospholipids, which are parts of cell membranes as well. So it can help burrow through cell membranes. And once it gets through that vacuole, it can enter into the cell. And it can move through the cell itself. Now it is a motile bacteria and it can actually use what is called ACT-A. So it undergoes actin polymerization. So the host cell has a actin cytoskeleton and the bacteria uses this for intracellular motility. So it uses the host cell's cytoskeleton to move around. And the term for this for Listeria monocytogenes is tumbling motility. This is a key point to make note of here for testing purposes. So this is tumbling motility. So it uses tumbling motility to move around the cell. And because it has these other tools like phospholipase C, it can actually burrow out of the host cell, go outside the host cell, and then enter into another host cell via the same mechanism. So this is how not only Listeria can survive the gastrointestinal processing, but it can also get into host cells and then move around between host cells to cause infection in other host cells, leading to the condition of listeriosis. So let's talk about the signs and symptoms of listeriosis in immunocompetent patients. So these are going to be otherwise healthy patients with a strong or healthy immune system. So some of the signs and symptoms that can occur from a listeria infection include nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. So these are going to be hallmark findings of a gastroenteritis. And then we can also see issues with fever and myalgias. Myalgias are muscle aches and pains. So it can act like a flu-like illness and in some cases can have these gastroenteritis-like symptoms such as nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. And then we can also see issues with malaise. So malaise is going to be just feeling unwell in general, back pain, and a headache as well. So these non-specific, vague, flu-like symptoms can occur in immunocompetent patients. Now a special case of immunocompetent patients is a pregnant patient. So in pregnant females we can see issues with premature delivery, spontaneous abortion, chorioamnitis, and stillbirth. So again this 
bacteria can cross the placenta and infect the fetus, and this can lead to all of these issues. And most of the time, we're going to consider pregnant patients as immunocompetent patients, except in the third trimester when their T-cell immunity is suppressed. So this is the time when they can have a more severe presentation of symptoms. So T-cell immunity is going to be important for combating listeriosis or listeria monocytogenes infections. So this is going to be key with regards to pregnant patients in the third trimester, but also other immunocompromised patients like HIV patients. So they're going to have suppressed T-cell immunity. And again, T-cell immunity is going to be what we need to combat this bacteria. Now, let's talk about the signs and symptoms in immunocompromised patients. So again, these are going to be patients who have HIV or AIDS or are on some immunosuppressive medication or are the extremes of age, very young, very old, and other patients who are diabetic as well. So again, all these issues are going to have to do with the suppressed T-cell immunity. And what we can see with this bacteria is that it can cause meningitis, so an inflammation of the meninges that surround the brain. So the signs and symptoms of meningitis are going to be a headache and a stiff neck. And we're going to see positive Brzezinski sign and a positive Koenig sign. So Brzezinski sign is where you have the patient lay down supine and you flex their neck and they are going to flex their hips and knees to compensate for that pressure within their central nervous system. So they can experience a stiff neck, some pain, and a reflex of flexing their hips and knees. Whereas the Koenig sign is where the patient's going to lay down flat, the clinician is going to flex their hip and their knee, and then the clinician is going to extend their knee. And if the patient describes issues or has pain, that would be a positive Koenig sign. Now patients can also have encephalitis. Encephalitis is an inflammation of the brain. So patients can often see issues with fever, headache, confusion, or altered mental status. So some patients can actually have a mixture of both of these, meningoencephalitis. And then we can also see issues with sepsis as well. And we're going to see sepsis most commonly in neonates less than five years old. And more specifically with neonates, we can see issues with something called granulomatosis infantiseptica. And again, this is going to be important for testing purposes. Granulomatosis infantiseptica is going to be a condition that can develop in neonates who are infected by listeria monocytogenes. And this condition is going to lead to widespread abscesses and granulomas. So it's going to be abscesses and granulomas throughout the neonate's body. And this can often be a cause of spontaneous abortion if the baby hasn't been delivered yet. So this is another important point to make note of as well. And because of all this, because of all of these issues we see in the immunocompromised patients and in neonates, this actually has one of the higher mortality rates for a foodborne illness, as I mentioned before. Now let's talk about diagnosis and prevention of listeriosis. So a clinician is going to diagnose this condition via bacterial culture from a blood sample, a cerebrospinal fluid sample or CSF sample, and placental fluids. And what is going to be used is a particular agar, which is called a mueller hinton agar. This is used to culture this bacteria. Now before we talk about the treatment, let's talk about prevention, so to prevent it from occurring in the first place. So what's going to be important for prevention is going to be hand washing. So we talked about it being a fecal oral route of transmission, avoidance of contaminated foods. We talked about it even growing in refrigerated environments. And not only that, we can also see it surviving a lot of acidic environments. We talked about it having that acidic tolerance response. So it can survive in salad dressings and other acidic compounds that you may not think it could. It's also important to wash vegetables and it's also important to cook foods. Now, its reproduction can slow down the hotter the temperatures get. Over 45 to 50 degrees, it can slow down quite a bit. But in order to really eliminate listeria from a food source, it's important to cook to at least 63 to 74 degrees Celsius or 145 to 165 Fahrenheit. Some sources will say at least 65. And depending on the type of food, if it's a processed meat, for instance, it may require a bit higher. Or if it's a, another type of meat, like a chicken, it may require cooking at one of these higher levels of the temperature range. Range. So that's also important to make note of as well. Now let's talk about how clinicians treat this condition. In the immunocompetent and otherwise healthy patients who have a good immune system, it's going to be a self-limited infection. Often doesn't require treatment. There may be some need of supportive treatment if they have a lot of nausea and vomiting and diarrhea. So they may need some fluids, but otherwise they don't need treatment like we see with other patient groups like the immunocompromised. So in the immunocompromised is where we're going to require some of these antibiotic treatments. So the antibiotic treatments are going to include IV ampicillin or penicillin G. And an alternative to this would be Septra, which is a combination of trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. And this is going to be used for patients who have a penicillin allergy. 
Now, because there are other causes of meningitis, which we may not be aware of, or we may have suspicion that they may have some other bacterial causes. Ceftriaxone can also be another antibiotic that can be added to the antibiotic regimen to combat other causes of meningitis. So because a patient may be having meningitis, even though you may have cultured listeria as a cause, there may be some other causes you may be suspicious for. So it may be important to actually add ceftriaxone to the treatment regimen. Gentamicin can also be used in addition to add more coverage for gram-negative bacteria, and this is especially important in infants. And then vancomycin may be used for MRSA coverage or methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. So more specifically, two important groups that we can talk about here. So in neonates, ampicillin can be used as long as the patient doesn't have an allergy to penicillin. And then gentamicin can be used in addition to that to increase the gram-negative coverage. And again, we talked about this being important in infants. And then in immunocompromised adults or adults older than the age of 50, ampicillin can be used plus ceftriaxone plus vancomycin. So these are going to be added because they're immunocompromised in general, so they could have other bacterial infections going on that could be leading to meningitis, and the vancomycin is going to be helpful for the MRSA, which they may also have as well. Please check out my lesson on Clostridium difficile and also on botulism. If you found this lesson helpful, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thanks so much for watching, and hope to see you next time.